All right, first up, though, public health experts have certainly had their hands full for the last couple of years because as soon as it seemed like we were making progress in the fight against coronavirus, then, well, we started dealing with monkeypox and... Now officials are sounding the alarm about polio infections popping up in the state of New York. So we have a lot to get through this morning. And for more on the triple threat, what we need to know to stop the spread and what parents need to know about back to school. Once again, infectious disease expert Dr. Amish Adalja joins us live this morning. It's always good to see you. I always appreciate you joining us. Uh, but I want to start with uh, the latest when it comes to COVID, BA5, uh, where we are now. And everybody's getting ready to head back to school. So a lot of parents are wondering, am I protected with the protections that I already have or do I need more? I think in general, most people are going to be pretty well protected against COVID-19. We've got vaccines, we've got boosters, we've got antivirals, we've got monoclonal antibodies, we have rapid tests, a whole lot of tools that we didn't have in 2020 or even 2021 that should influence how people risk calculate. And I think hopefully this school year will be one that is not disrupted by COVID-19. There's certainly going to be cases, but they're gonna be handled in a different manner because the threat level is very different when we have all of these tools and we have everybody basically eligible to be vaccinated. You know, one of the, the topics that's popped up, I guess, and, you know, the whole time we were talking about COVID over the last two and a half years, we kept talking about things like herd immunity, essentially, or just even our own antibodies that would be enough strength. Are we at that point now where if someone, especially a youngster going back to school now, maybe they've had it in the past, does that protect them enough now going back to school? Or would you recommend even getting a booster, even if it only lasts for a couple of weeks or months? In general, if you're somebody that's low risk, you're going to be protected against what matters, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. If you've been vaccinated, if you've had prior infection or some combination, I think that boosters really make sense in the high risk populations, elderly people, people with comorbid conditions. Those individuals definitely need to be boosted and they have, they have an under, they've been under boosted. And I think that's an issue that we still have to, to focus on targeting boosters to those who benefit from the most. But for the average healthy person, COVID-19 is a very manageable illness now. All right, let's go on to topic number two, and that is monkeypox. And we've talked about this numerous times in the past, and I know that you say it's different, right, than when we dealt with COVID the first time, because with COVID, we didn't know what we were dealing with, so you had to essentially come up with a vaccine from scratch. How much of an advantage is it, I guess, in trying to limit the outbreak of monkeypox, just at least knowing what you're dealing with? I definitely think it, it makes it a lot easier. This is a, a virus that's been known to science since the 1950s. We have off-the-shelf vaccines, antivirals, tests that work. What's happened is we've had an incompetent response. It's not been able to use these tools that science had given us decades ago. And I think that's really inexcusable. This should have been something that would have been easy to stop. But what we've seen is the government really falter and be unable to be as responsive as we need it to be. That's why monkeypox is the problem that it is. But it is something that I think eventually will be controlled because we have those tools, because we have those knowledge. And it's not a very contagious virus. It's not a respiratory virus. So a lot of people, when it they first started hearing about monkeypox and the call went out and as far as transmission it was a close personal contact just to eliminate some of the I guess concern that potentially could be there is there the risk of getting it from things like touching doorknobs using gym equipment getting massages uh, other things along those lines you have to think about the fact that a pathogen or a virus has many different ways it can spread and not all of them are going to be equally important. And while it may be technically or biologically possible in some instances to, to get it from a doorknob, is that how people are going to get infected? Probably not. Those are all very minor ways that the virus transmits on bedding or on clothing. What we really see being, being behind most of the cases is close contact between individuals, either sexual partners, household contacts. So I think that there's going to be a lot of consternation about all these really minor ways, which are not going to really contribute to the spread. And I think that what we want to do is really focus on what's driving infections and halt those. And we haven't seen spread into the, into the population generally. It seems to be really restricted to individuals' risk factors, which tells us that those other modes of transmission are not very efficient for this virus, even if in a textbook it might be listed as one way that the virus can get from person to person. Sure. Okay. Dr. Adalja, I heard everything you just said, but I have to ask you this because you could have a billion plus dogs in the world, but you have one dog in France that gets the virus transmitted to them. And then people here wonder, do I have to worry about my pets as well? 
We know that this virus is a virus that can infect animals. And what we've known is that people can transmit this virus to their pets. That's why we tell people to isolate away from their pets if they have monkeypox. But is our dogs a major reservoir? No, I don't think so. I think this is a, a virus that comes from animals. Our, our danger really is not that it gets into, into people's pets, but that it gets into, for example, squirrels or rodents. Then I think the game is up in the United States because now you, then you have a domestic reservoir. But I don't think this is a major issue in dogs or people uh, that have pets or are petting dogs. What, what we're talking about is making sure that you don't give it to your pet. It's sure. unlikely that a pet will then transfer it on to other uh, other animals, especially if it's someone's pet. It's, it's really about wild animals that we're worried about getting infected, like rats, for example. Third topic, and I'll combine this when it comes to polio. We've heard of cases in New York, in New York State, and New York City. Uh, I guess the questions are, how concerned should we be about any possible resurgence of polio, which we tend to think of that was in the way back days. Uh, and second of all, we've always been told that we're vaccinated for polio, or you had to be at some point. How do you really know if you are? So if you're somebody that's vaccinated, fully vaccinated against polio, this is not a threat to you. The vaccine works tremendously well. What, what they found in the wastewater around New York City are vaccine-derived polio viruses. And you have to remember that we use the Salk vaccine, the, jo the one that Jonas Salk developed in Pittsburgh. Um, but there is another vaccine called the Sabin vaccine, which is an oral vaccine. And in rare circumstances, people will shed viruses that could be dangerous to others. And what's happened is that's what they found in the wastewater there. It's not wild polio. It's vaccine-derived polio. And if you're unvaccinated, in rare circumstances, that can cause disease. And that's what's happened. And it's not surprising when you look at where this happened in New York City, Rockland County, or Orange County, New York City, places where we saw a large measles outbreak several years ago because people were not vaccinated in that area. And I think that's the issue, that we have too many unvaccinated people clustered together in some of those New York, uh, New York surround, City surrounding counties that's given this virus an ability to, to spread. And I think we really have to put the blame on this on the anti-vaccine movement. There's too much distrust of vaccines and there's too much erosion of our, our vaccine protection that's happened through the pandemic. And we've got an anti-vaccine movement that's all, it's all hyped up after COVID. And you have a traditional area there where people were not getting vaccinated and that's kind of synergized now. All right, listen, real quick, we got to wrap things up, but just to reiterate, for those who are vac vaccinated against polio though, if you are vaccinated, that is that good for life or do you need a booster? It's good for life. Uh, we only recommend booster vaccinations for people who are traveling to really high risk areas like Ukraine, like Yemen, Israel, the Palestinian occupied areas, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. That's where we want people to get boosters. If you've gotten your normal uh, normal series, you don't need to do and worry about anything at this point. All right. Good to know. Dr. Adasha, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us this morning once again. Thanks for having me. You're absolutely welcome. We'll turn things back over to you, Jacqueline.